<laughs> okay, so let's uh, go ahead and start the lecture. The, the lecture should be relatively uh, short. It'll probably be about 30 minutes or so. And there's no activity today. So after the lecture, you know, if you want to leave, that's fine. I know after I took a test, I never felt like doing much afterwards. If you want to go chill someplace, that's perfectly okay. Um, if you do stay, you can uh, work on your labs. Remember, lab four is due this Friday. Okay, so that's November 3rd. And then after the lecture today, you'll be able to do lab five. Uh, lab five is not due until the Friday, a week from this Friday, okay, November 10th. And as I mentioned last class, lab five is really uh, a lot of what you did in lab four with memory added, okay? And the last thing we need to talk about before you can do lab five is what a memory register is, okay? All right, so. From last time, I had this up on the board. And if you didn't get a picture of this last time, I would recommend that you take a picture of it before you leave today. Because this is the system Verilog code that you need, uh, that I'm giving you that models a D flip flop. Okay, remember we talked about a D flip flop last time? And the D flip flop, it's a edge sensitive latch, okay, it can store a single bit. And, you know, I've given you everything except I didn't declare the inputs and outputs. Okay, well, you should be able to do that by now. You've done that plenty of times. Uh, remember that when you have an output within an always block, like an always FF, you do have to include logic when you declare that output, like we've talked about before. Okay. Uh, also, remember, this is a key feature. Of, uh, when you model, you know, a memory element like a flip flop, is that the way you create the storage is with omitting an else from an if statement. So you can see here, there's uh, if reset, right? If that's active, and everything's active high, and everything's synchronous for this D flip flop. So if the synchronous reset is active high, we're gonna make the Q output zero, right? Because that's what reset means: make Q equal to zero. Um, else if if set is active high, that's going to make the Q output one because that's what set means, right? To make Q one. And if we're not resetting and we're not setting, well, then if enter, which is the same thing as enable or load, if that's active high again, well, then that's when the Q output gets assigned whatever's on the D input. And if you're not doing any of this, right? You're not resetting, you're not setting, you're not uh, entering. Well, then we want storage. We want the output just to remain the same as what it was previous, right? We want next data queue just to equal present state of queue. And that's what creates a latch. Okay, that's one way in system parallel you can create a latch is just by leaving out an else in an if state. Okay? So are there any questions about this? I, you know, we talked about this last time, but any questions before we move on to something new? Because this, this isn't new, right? We, we covered this. I just wanted to review this before we go to something new. Okay. Well, what's new today is that if you want to store more than a single bit, right? If you want to store something that's multi-bit, that's a memory register. And a memory register is made out of multiple flip-flops, okay, multiple D flip-flops. So remember the adding circuit that you built a few labs ago, right, the RCA, and how that was made out of multiple adders, right? We had three full adders and a half adder, but then you modified it to all full adders. And remember, we talked about how you needed an adder for each bit column, right, each bit column that you're adding. Well, the similar thing here, for, for each bit that you wanna store, you need a flip flop. Okay, so this memory register has four D flip flops, so it can store four bits, right? Each flip flop is storing a bit. Um, when you take CPE 233, right, the follow on class to this one, that microprocessor that you build, the memory registers for that microprocessor are 32 bit. 
They have 32 bit registers. So they're going to have 32 D flip flops, right? Because each bit needs a flip flop. Okay. So if you take a look at how uh, this register is constructed, um, you'll see that all the D inputs of the individual flip flops come together to form a four bit main D input. So like this flip flop could be storing D0, right? This one D1, this one D2, this one D3. So it's similar to the adding circuit where each of the numbers that you're adding, remember the A and B, they were each four bit, right? But the third bit of the input would go to an adding circuit, right? And the second bit and so on. Same sort of thing here, except now we've got flip flops instead of adding circuits, right? And the Q outputs of each of the individual flip flops come together and make a four bit main Q output. Right? So this is like your Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3. So that's analogous to in the adding circuit, you have the sums of the individual adding circuits coming together to make the four bit main sum output. So you see how it's similar? Uh, now, what's different with a register compared to the adding circuit is remember, the adding circuit was combinational, right? It had no memory. Uh, this is a register, right? Made of flip flops that has memory, right? It can store data. So this register has a clock input, right? Adding circuits don't have a clock input because they're not sequential. And all the clock inputs of all the individual flip flops come together and, and make a mean clock, okay? That's also a single bit. Um, when clock inputs like this are connected together, it puts all these flip-flops in sync with each other, right? They're all gonna be storing at the same time or they all could be possibly changing where um, Q is assigned to D at the same time or they could all be re resetting at the same time or they could all be setting at the same time, okay? By connecting the clocks together, they're all in step with each other. Okay, so do you have any questions just about how the register is formed? Um, you know, again, if you had a 32-bit register, there'd be 32 of these D flip-flops connected up in the same fashion as these four are. Okay, so any questions? All right, well now, okay, you're gonna like this. Okay, you're gonna like this. Maybe you're a little too tired right now to appreciate it. You're gonna like this eventually, and that's, how we go about modeling a register in system bear life. Now, remember the adding circuit, right? The RCA, do you remember how you modeled that? Like what did you do in system bear life when you had the four adders and wanted to make it into an RCA, right? An adding circuit for the four bits, what, what did we do? Dot. Uh, dot notation. Oh, well, yeah, you did the structural model and you had to do like the dot input or output then in front of, yeah. So you, you had to do the, the structural model and make all these connections. And you could do the same thing here, but there's an easier way that we didn't tell you about before that now you're ready for it because you kind of passed the initiation, you know, of doing structural models. See, the way that you can model this register in system Verilog that's a lot easier than how you did the RCA, is that you can take the same code that you have for the flip-flop, the single flip-flop, and just do this. Instead of declaring the D input as a single bit input, like you will here, declare it as a four bit input. Change it to three to zero, input D. Oh, wait, those are input first, sorry. input and three to zero, right? So you're just taking the same code that you have for the single D flip-flop and you're changing that single bit D input to a four bit input. And then do the same thing for the output. Output, now what am I gonna have to put here since the output is within an always block? All right, good put logic, so it'll be output logic. In three to zero Q. All right, so you're just gonna make those two edits and then 
Also, since now Q is four bits, when you assign it a value, it's got to be four bits. So but I'll put comments. You know, you'll have to change this to just Q assigned to four tick mark B and then four zeros. I and mean, you'll have to do the same for the, the set. You'll have to change it to four ones. Okay. So to model this four bit register, okay, because lab five has a four bit register, you just take what you had for the single bit D flip flop and just make a few edits, right? You just got to edit this input, edit this output, you know, make this four bits, also make this four bits. Okay. And then the software, okay, Bavado, will do the work for you. Okay, based on this code I just uh, wrote here, it will generate hardware, you know, register it looks just like this. And you see, you could have done that when we modified the RCA to have all four uh, full adders. Instead of, you know, doing the structural model like we did, we could have just taken a full adder and done the same thing and let the software do it. But we wanted you to do it the hard way initially, just so you know, and, and also just to get used to structural model. That was like our first example of structural models. And truth be told, the RCA, the ripple carry adder that you built in lab two and you know that we've been using, it's one of the most inefficient ways of doing addition, binary addition. There's actually um, adding circuits that are much more efficient. So when you let the software do the work, it actually builds an adder that's not an RCA. It's a different type of adder that if you take advanced classes in digital, I think if you take the class after CP233, which if you're a CPE major, you have to, if you're an EV, that's not part of the uh, EV course, unless you minor, I guess, in computers. But it, it will actually build a more efficient adding circuit. It's efficient, time-wise and always. Time-wise. And, you know, a lot of times that equates the power also. Yeah, it's a more advanced topic type of adding circuit. So that's why it's you know not mentioned at the lower levels. Yeah, I think when you take CP333, I think that's when they talk about it. Okay, so the flip-flop high-level black box diagram, we talked about this last time. You know, it has a single D input, single Q output. Clock input is always single bit. Do you remember what this little triangle on the uh, clock input and the symbol here, what that indicates? I talked about it. I think it was kind of brief, so you might have missed it last time, but you know, what's that? Uh, no, I mean, that tells us it's clock in. Just turn it off. Okay, well, just trigger. Yeah, I mean, if it was triggered on the low, it'd have a little bubble. Uh, this is triggered on the, uh, when I say low, falling edge. Um, this is triggered on the rising edge. But remember, a flip flop is an edge sensitive latch. Right. Remember how we started with the latch, and then we said, well, what makes a flip-flop? And I showed you the additional circuitry, right, logic circuitry on that diagram that you would need, and I recommended that you watch that video that I have posted on Canvas so you can see the details of how it gets to edge sensitivity. But that's what the little triangle represents. It's an edge-sensitive uh, device. Okay, so now let's talk about what the high-level black box diagram for the memory register is going to look like. So what do you think it's going to look like? Okay. All right. So same inputs and outputs when you say same thing. Okay. So it have a clock, it have a D, have a Q, and then what else would be different? It have a four bits. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay. So you see that's the only difference between a flip-flop and a register, right? Register has multiple flip-flops because you need a flip-flop per bit. The store, you know, every bit you're storing needs a flip-flop. So you know in CP2, CP233, this is going to have a 32, and this is going to have a 32. Okay. All right, I gotta move the camera. Any questions as I move the camera? Oops.
So can you see why this is a good lecture after an exam? You don't have to think too much, right? Maybe students are just multi-bit flip-flops. Uh, we're going to tilt this a little this way. There we go. Okay, so let's talk about lab five. As I said earlier, lab five is a lot like lab four, except you have additional memory. So this is where it's a good time to look at the diagram that's on the table. There should be enough of these for each person. Okay. The handout has a diagram on each side of it. Okay, this is on one side of it, this is on the other side. Does everybody have their own? You need one? Does anyone else need a handout? There you go. Sure. All right, everyone has one. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So if you look at this side, it should look pretty familiar because most of what's on this side of the handout is lab four. Right, so you see lab five is going to be a lot of what you did for lab four. Now we're deleting some things. We're going to delete this uh, bin to hex decoder, and we're going to el eliminate this mux that um, was being uh, controlled by the uh, validity bit. And we're going to and we're going to delete this neg output. Okay, so where you see the x's, those are getting deleted. And then you're going to add this. Okay, so. What you see in this diagram, that's what you're going to add to this other diagram. And you can see that um, the D input of this top module, which is a register, goes to T5. Okay, so the T5 over here, which is what's coming out of this MUX. What is coming out of that MUX, the T5 MUX? The one that's connected to the decoder. The, the binary sum. Yeah, that's the sum of the result, right? The four-bit binary sum. Um, and then T6, which is the D input of the middle module on this diagram, it's going to T6, which is the output of the AND gates. What's the significance of the output of that AND gates? That's where it's negative. Yeah, that's the sign, right? Um, that's whether the result is negative or positive. And then the D input of the bottom module, um, it's going to T7, and T7, T7 is uh, the output of our validity checker, right? So that's our validity bit, telling us whether it's valid or not. Okay? All right. So you should be able to tell me what the high-level black box diagram of this entire circuit would look like. You know, what are our main inputs and main outputs? Let's start with the inputs. What are our main inputs? You should be able to tell me this by now. Or bit A and B. Okay, that's correct, right? That we got, just like in lab four, we've got a four bit A, four, oops. Four bit A and four bit B, right? Those are the two binary numbers we're adding or subtracting. You also have a clock, very clear. Yeah, very good. Because people can miss that. If you look at if you look at this diagram here, see the clear, enter, or sorry, clock, enter, and clear. Those are also main inputs. Now, you know, it's not outside the dash box like. A, B, and actually we forgot, which one did we forget? So, so. Yeah, we got sub two from uh, lab four. Right, so these three inputs, they're the same as lab four, but then in addition, we have the clock, and we have clear, which is the same as reset. And remember, clear and reset mean the same thing here. And then enter. And enter is the same thing as enable or load. Okay. When you enter or load or enable any of those, that's when Q is going to be assigned to whatever the D input is. All right. So you see, these are our main inputs to lab five. How about the outputs? 
What outfits do we have? Seg. Yep, we're going to have seg. And how many bits for these? Yeah, seg is eight this time. AN is still four. Why is AN still four? What's the significance of the four bit AN? What's AN doing again? We still have four. Yeah, remember, there's a AN bit for each of the seven segment displays, and there's four on the basis three board. But notice that for lab A, the seg output is eight instead of seven. If, you know, seg was seven in lab four, but here in lab eight, or excuse me, lab five, uh, it's eight bits. And that's because if you look at this diagram here, the seg output is coming from this module labeled universal essay. That module, um, we give you the code. Okay, it's actually a text file. We don't give you the system Verilog file, but we give you uh, the text file of the code. And it's written in Verilog. Okay, Dr. Mealy wrote it. And what this module is, it's, it's a time multiplexer. Okay, and what this module enables us to do is use all four seven segment displays at once. Okay, I'm showing different numbers. If you don't have a time multiplexer, then each of those four displays, seven segment displays, are gonna show the same data. Okay, like for example, in lab four, if you had changed the data of this MUX, instead of 1110 and having the result only shown on the furthest to the right seven segment display, if you made these all zeros, it would show the same number, the same result on all four displays. Okay, without a time multiplexer, there's no way for those seven segment displays to show different numbers. They would only show the same number. Okay, and that's because those displays are hardwired in parallel. Okay, they do that because it's actually cheaper to wire them in parallel and then use time multiplexing to get different numbers. So what time multiplexing is, you know, concept wise, is that let's say there's this four digit number, 1,279, that's gonna be displayed. Well, what the time multiplexer does is that it will show the nine on the furthest to the right display, and sometime later, it will show the seven on the next display next to it. And sometime later, it will show the two. And sometime later, it will show the one that goes back to the nine. And it keeps repeating. And it does it so quickly that our eyes can't detect the changes. We just, we just see a steady number. Okay, but really what's happening is the time multiplex is putting the number there, then there, then there, then there, then back, and it just keeps repeating. But again, it does it so fast that our eyes just see the steady number, okay? Um, and the reason why we give you the code that Dr. Mealy just uh, designed is because it's not trivial. Like, I would recommend that, you know, instead of just copying and pasting, you know, the code from the text file blindly, kind of just kind of look at it. I mean, a lot of it's gonna look strange, but some of it you'll recognize, okay? Um, now it's written in Verilog, so, you know, for example, instead of seeing logic, you're going to see the words reg, R-E-G, and you're going to see the word wire, A-W-I-R-E. Because in Verilog, when internal signals are declared, logic is not used, wire is used. And also in Verilog, when you have an output within an always, instead of logic, you put reg, R-E-G. Okay. And also, like in Verilog, you don't have always FF and always home. You just have always. And that forces you to remember that you have to use the different symbology when you're assigning an output. Remember, it's the it's this when it's always FF and it's only an equal sign in uh, always home. In, in Verilog, you know, you don't, it's not distinguished between FF and home. It's just distinguished by these symbols that you uh, you know, to, uh, that you assign your outputs with. Okay, so anyway, that's just a couple of examples, a couple of differences, and those are the main differences between the two. Okay, so let's see, where are we at? Okay, any 
Any questions up to this point? The rest of what I want to talk about is just a suggested order of how you do lab five. And then there's some, you know, particular notes that I just want to make you aware of um, before we call it a day here. But any questions up to this point? Okay, so this is a suggested order. When you, well, first of all, make sure, you know, lab four is the priority. If you haven't finished lab four, that's what you want to work on. You know, because that's due Friday. Has anyone finished lab four? A few people. Okay, a few people in my, oh, actually, more than a, a few. Okay, that's more than my eight to 11. That's good. All right, so, you know, concentrate on lab four because that's due this Friday. But then after that, you can now work on lab five also. Um, and, and again, that's not due until Friday of next week. But this is my suggested order. First thing, create your flip flop, your D flip flop. And again, I give you most of what you need. Um, you basically just have to fill in the input and output uh, declarations. And then you want to test it, right? You want to simulate it. So this is where you got to think about um, test cases, right? Because I'm not giving you the test cases, but like for any module that you want to test, you want to make sure that it's working the way you intended it to work, right? So you would definitely want a test case where you're testing the reset, right? That when reset is high, it's making the Q output go to zero. Now you want a test case for set. You want a test case to make sure enter's working. You want a test case to make this make sure the storage is working, right? Because if it's not resetting, not setting, not store, um, not um, entering, well then it should just be keeping the previous previous value at the output, right? So there's four test cases right there. You should also test Priority, right? So remember, the highest priority should be reset, second highest set, next highest enter, right? The lowest priority is when it's stored because if it's not doing any of these things, that's when we store. So how would you check to make sure resets the highest priority? Like what would your test case be? Light up set, set X. Yeah, I would make them all, all active, right? Like make your reset active, your set active, your enter active. Right. If, if they're all active, it should reset, right? Because it, you know, as long as you did the stitch statement in the correct order, right? You put reset first, that should be the highest priority. But you know, you need to test it and make sure. Okay. Uh, and then once you know your your flip-flop is working the way it should, create the memory register. Again, it's it's this code with these edits. Right, so if you've got a flip flop working and you make these edits correctly, your register should work. Okay, but you got to test it, and you basically test it the same way you did the flip flop. Right, it's just now your output is four bits instead of one bit. All right, okay. Now, here's something new that you haven't seen before because you haven't simulated something that's sequential. Okay, remember. Flip flops are sequential, and since registers are made of flip flops, they're also sequential. Well, anytime you're testing a sequential circuit, you have to generate a clock in the sim file. Okay, so this is in the sim file, not the design source. It's in the sim file. And this code, and this is one way to do it. There's other ways to generate a clock, but this is probably the simplest. This code that generates the clock, it goes between the line where UUT is. Right, UUT under test, you know that line there? And that's where you put the file that you're simulating, and then you put the connections between the design source and the and the um, the sim file, right? The inputs and outputs. Well, in between that line and the beginning of where your test cases are, you want to put this code here. It's an always block. Okay, so always, here's the begin for the always, here's the end. And then here's the code that's going to make the clock signal, which is a square wave. So what does this number sign five mean? Wait, five, 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 six. Right, exactly. Because in your sim file, where you have your test cases, you know how you have number sign 10, then you have a test case, then you have number sign 10, another test case. That number sign 10, that's a 10 nanosecond delay between test cases. If you didn't have that number sign 10, right, that delay between test cases, all the test cases would be on top of each other <laughs> and your timing diagram would just be, you know, gibberish, 
Okay, so that number sign 10 between the test cases, it, it's what separates them. So you can see them in time as time progresses on your timing diagram. Okay, so you see what this code is going to do is it's going to make clock high, okay, a one for five nanoseconds. Then it's going to go low. five nanoseconds, and then it's just going to keep repeating. Because when something's in the an always block, it just keeps going. Okay, it just goes on for an eternity. Okay, so it's just going to keep going one to five nanoseconds, zero to five nanoseconds, and it just keeps going. Okay, well, what's the period of the square wave? Okay. Remember, period is how long it takes a waveform to repeat. Right? It doesn't matter like where you look in the waveform. You just look to where it starts repeating and the time difference that's your, that's the period of the signal. Right? I would imagine you've seen that in physics and, and also in EE e labs. Right? Everybody knows what period is. Okay, how do you get frequency from period? Inverse. Frequency is just one over period. Now, what is a nanosecond? Like 10 to the what? Negative. 10 to the negative. So can you tell me, or can you plug into a calculator what the reciprocal of 10 nanoseconds is? What is it? Mega. It is mega, but what mega? It is megahertz, but one mega. Oh, it's more than that. Five megahertz. More than that. You're on the right track, though. He said one, you said 10. <laughs> you got a calculator, put in one over 10 to the minus nine. It's 100 megahertz. Period of 10 nanoseconds is 100 megahertz. And the reason why we use this period and this frequency is because that's the frequency that the basis three board operates at. Okay, so. So in your test cases, when you're using that number sign 10 and you're separating each of the test cases by 10 nanoseconds, each test case is a clock pulse on the basis. Okay. All right, so you got that. Again, this would be a good thing to take a picture of so you don't forget it, because you're gonna need it when you simulate your flip flop and your register also when you simulate the whole thing. All right, but once you're done with that, the next thing I suggest that you do is, is the copy and the paste that I talked about earlier from a text file for this time multiplexer that Dr. Mealy uh, designed. Now, be careful when you do this copy paste because there's a couple of things that tend to happen every quarter to, to some people. One is, be careful that after you paste it into the Verilog file that you create, make sure you don't get any wraparound. And what I mean by that is what has happened in the past, and I don't know exactly why this happens, but in, in Dr. Mealy's code, he'll have some comments, you know, the double slash, and then he'll have a comment. Well, what can happen sometimes is like the comment gets split and, you know, it's on one line, but then the rest of it's on the next line and it doesn't have the double slashes. So it, so Favado thinks it's code when it's actually part of a comment. So if you see a bunch of red lines and you're getting a bunch of errors, that could be one of the reasons, okay? Because we have used this module that Dr. Mealy designed for at least 10 years. We know it works, <laughs> okay? It doesn't have errors, okay? So if you're getting errors, there's something that happened in the translation from the text file to the file that you created. Now, another thing that will cause errors that has happened is that when you go to create this file, make sure you choose Verilog and not system Verilog, okay? Because if you choose system Verilog and you put Verilog code into it, it's going to flag all the things it doesn't recognize, like wire and reg. It's going to flag those as errors. It's not expecting it since it's um, you know, in a system Verilog file. 
See, Bavado will run mixed files, like everything that you're going to be building, right? The flip flop, the register, and all the stuff you did in the lab for, that's all system Verilog. And then Mealy's module is going to be the only thing written in Verilog. But Bavado can run mixed languages. And in fact, later on this quarter, there'll be a couple of modules that we give you that are in VHDL, okay, which is a totally different type of language to um, model hardware, totally different than Verilog and system Verilog. Okay, so then uh, once you have all this, then you would create the structural model that connects this all together. Now, when you get to that point, what I recommend is I would copy and paste over the code that you have for lab four, because you know all of this is going to be the same as what you had for lab four, and then you're just going to have to add this to it. Okay, so now if you take a look at these two diagrams, as I mentioned earlier, this D input of this top module, this top register, it's going to T5, which is the binary result, right? It's the four bit binary result of the sum of the addition or subtraction. So you see, that's what that register is doing. It's storing the four bit results. Okay, and that's why it's a four bit register. Okay, this middle register, it's the input is going to T6, which is telling us whether it's negative or positive result, right? So think of that as the sign bit for the results. So that middle register is just storing a single bit for the sign. Now we call it a register, but it's really just a flip-flop. And I suppose you can call a flip-flop a one-bit register, <laughs> you know, but technically a register stores multiple bits. So even though this is labeled register, it's really just a D flip-flop, okay? And then the bottom uh, register D flip-flop, that's storing the validity bit, okay? All right, so now look at where the outputs of these um, memory modules go. The Q output of the top register, which is storing the binary results, it's going to input CNT1 of Mealy's module. Um, the Q output of the sign register, right, the, the flip flop that's storing the sign bit, it's going to the sign input of Mealy's module. And the Q output of the flip flop that's storing the validity bit is going to the valid input of Mealy's module. Now, Mealy designed his module such that if the valid input is a one, then it's going to show the data that's on the CNT input on the seven segment displays using the time multiplexing that we talked about earlier. If the valid is a zero, it's going to show all dashes. Okay, so each seven segment display, the middle segment would like, it would just show four dashes. Uh, the sign input of Mealy's module. If that's a zero, then to show a positive, the furthest to the left display won't be lit at all. But if it's negative, the furthest to the left display will show a dash for a negative sign. Okay? Uh, so that's how that all works. Now look at CNT1. Okay, again, that's the input that takes the data, you know, and shows it as a four digit. Um, well, if it is four digits, it, it shows it as four digits on the um, seven segment displays. If it's two digits, it, the furthest to the left seven segment displays will be off and just the two seven segment displays to the right will be lit with, with numbers. But notice that there's a bit mismatch. Okay, we talked about a bit mismatch uh, earlier in the quarter. In fact, there was an activity that had some bit mismatches. And do you remember what we used to take a bit mismatch and match it? Pat it with Okay, you can pet it with zeros. And, and what um, like construct in Verilog is used to do that? Like, say that is it the comma? The, well, there's a comma involved. But you have like a, a series of zeros that are common. Like you can sort of concatenate. So ah, there it is. Yeah. That's the word I was looking for. Right, yeah. You were, you were saying the syntax, but yeah, I just wanted the word. Yeah, remember concatenation, joining of bits. So as Ethan was just pointing out, you could pad with zeros, right? And, and when we pad this with zeros, what side are the zeros gonna go on of this four bit binary number? Significant. Yeah, 
right? Because we don't want to change the value, right? So you want to put the 10 bits on the left side of these four bits, okay? So, you know, that's something that you're going to have to look at is, is making sure that you match up these bits. Uh, now, in newer versions of Avado, I think the software might even take care of bit mismatches. Like if you don't do it, the software will do it for you in the newer versions. But in older versions, you have to do it. Otherwise, it'll come back with error. So it'll say bit mismatch. But I would, to get some practice, even if Avado does it for you in the newer version, I would practice it and, and take care of it yourself, just so you know how to do it. Okay, so let's see, what else do we have to talk about here? So um, we talked about, oh, the test cases for the overall, right, the overall circuit, uh, it's on Canvas like all the other labs have been. And the test cases for lab five are the same test cases as lab four, except you have to add test cases to show that the reset works, right, that it clears. Um, you also, let's see, what else do you have to do? Well, you got to make sure um, that the memory is working, okay? I mean, the way you make sure the memory is working is, um, you know, like when you download it to your board, your basis board, as you're changing the switches, okay, to go to a different test case, the seven-segment display should show the old result until you push the enter button, right? The display doesn't update to a new result until you hit enter. Otherwise, it just holds the old results, right? And then what's gonna happen when you hit reset? Zeros, or dashes. It should show all zeros. Oh, when it resets, it should show all zeros. It only shows all dashes if it's invalid, like an invalid result. Uh, let's see, oh, this is very important. And this is one of the reasons why I had you watch that video where Dr. Benson shows you how to pull out the intermediate signals and put it on the timing diagram, you know, one reason, you know, the, the biggest reason to know how to do that technique is in order to troubleshoot complex circuits. Because again, if you know that technique, you know, pulling out these intermediate signals, you can trace the signal from input to output to see where you first run into a problem. And that narrows down, you know, what to look at as far as fixing. But this is another reason why you need to know that technique that Dr. Benson showed you in that troubleshooting video. And that's because when you look at the output of this high multiplexer, okay, the SEG and the AM, when you look at it on the timing diagram, it's not gonna make any sense. It's just gonna be gibberish or it's gonna hold the same value. And that's because the simulator is not designed to show time multiplexing. Okay, what's going on here? Just, it doesn't have that capability. So what you have to do to verify that your overall design is working, you have to look at what's going into Mealy's module. Okay, so you got to look at CNT1, right? That's the binary result. You have to look at the sign bit, right? You have to look at the validity bit. Because like I said, we know Mealy's module works. We've used it for years. It works. <laughs> So if what's going into Mealy's module is correct, you can be guaranteed that what's coming out of it's gonna be correct, okay? I mean, I can't tell you how many times, even though I go over this in class and I, I expect it's gonna happen this quarter because it happens every quarter. You don't know how many times I get emails and it's, Gary, I'm looking at the output of the overall timing diagram and SEG and AN, they don't make any sense at all. Is this right? And I just email back. Yeah, that's what you're supposed to see. <laughs> Hoping that they'll remember. Oh, yeah, we got to look at what's going in. So, anyway. All right, so we talked about that. I'll come back to constraints. Okay, we talked about how you delete the decoder from lab four. You delete the validity nuts from lab four. You got to add the two uh, flip flops, right? One's going to store the sign bit, one's going to store the validity bit. You got to have one four bit register that's storing the number um, of the results. Uh, okay, we talked about this, what the register is storing, that's the binary result, right? That's the sign bit, that's the validity bit. So we talked all about that. We talked about how to solve the bit mismatch. Okay, we talked about these inputs of Mealy's module, so we covered all that. Okay, we'll come back. No, this is the next step. All right, this is another common 
mistake that's made. And this is an understandable mistake, but it's still a mistake. Okay, and that's, if you look at this diagram here, the clear input, the main clear input, right, the one for the higher level uh, black box diagram, that's going to the clear of the four bit register. It's also going to the clear of the flip flop that's storing the sign bit. But notice that the main clear does not connect to the clear of the validity flip flop, right? The flip flop that's storing the validity bit. You see how the main clear connects to the set instead of the clear? See, a lot of people look at that and they think it's a typo and they end up connecting it to the clear instead of the set like the diagram shows and they run into a problem. Anyone think about what would happen if you didn't connect this main clear to the set of the flip-flop that's storing the validity bit? It goes back to what Neely's module is gonna do based on whether we have a zero or a one at this validity input. And also it has to do with what set and reset mean. You want to default, so dollar, right? There you go, you're, you're on the right track, yeah. See, when we clear, what do we want the display to show when we clear? Zero. You wanna show all zeros. So if you clear this four bit register, that's gonna make the binary output zero like we want. Also, if you clear the sign bit, that's gonna make the sign bit zero, which means it won't show a dash. Right? We don't, again, we don't want a negative zero, right? And then if you were to clear, the validity bit and make it zero, Mealy's module would show all dashes instead of zeros. So you wanna make the validity bit a one so it will show the zeros, you know, meaning that the reset value is valid. And it's okay. sort of <laughs> yeah, so again, you don't know how many times I get emails and they're like, Gary, my overall design, everything works, but when I go to reset it, it shows dashes instead of zeros. And sure enough, it's because they connected this to clear instead of set. Okay. And again, I can understand why someone would think that. They they probably go, oh, yeah, Gary's always making mistakes. He really meant that to be clear, but this isn't a mistake. Okay. And what does the ground symbol mean? Those of you that had circuits should know the ground symbol means what? Zeros. Zero. So you just connect those inputs that have the ground symbol to zero. All right. So that's that. And the last thing, okay, unless you have questions, is in the constraints file for lab five. Oh, well, first of all, lab four, and that's the first lab that you had the seven segment display. You know how there's a seg section in constraints and there's an AN. And when you numbered them, in, let's see, when you numbered them in lab four, let's see, how did you do it? You went, you went seven, is it seven to zero? Six. Or six to zero, right? There was seven, there was seven bits, right? There was, there was, there was, there was, there was like four or two things that you did backwards. Like let's say that A, B, C, D, E, O, T, I started G, F, well, I'm I'm just trying to remember. Well, yeah, you're talking about like the truth table, but in the constraints file, when we did the numbering, like for example, when we did the numbering of AN, we started with three and then went three, two, one, zero, didn't we? So we went descending, right? Three, two, one, zero. So then when we did seg, it was um, six down to zero because there's seven segments, right? In lab four. Lab five, like we said earlier, SEG now has eight instead of seven. The other difference is based on how Dr. Mealy designed his tiny multiplexer, you have to number the opposite direction as what you did in lab four, all right? So lab four was, you know, three, two, one, zero. Lab five, you gotta go three, two, one, zero, right? You just reverse the order. And, and same thing for the SEG. You reverse the order and also, what's different in SEG for lab five is you are using the decimal point. That's the extra bit. Okay, so you start with the decimal point and then go from there. Okay, so the best thing to do is when you get to the constraints for lab five, copy over what you had for lab four and then just edit it and reverse the numbers for both AN and SEG. 
That's how I would do it. Okay? All right, so I think we talked about everything. So you now have enough information uh, to do lab five, but like I said earlier, lab four is the priority until you get that done, and then you want to work on lab five. Okay, there's no activity today. So, um, you know, we're done for the next 20 minutes. You know, if you want to stay here and work on lab four, that's okay. I have to set up for my, my section from three to six as far as, because they have an exam today. So I won't be able to answer any questions until I'm done with the setup. But Kathy is here, so Kathy could answer your questions while I'm setting up for my next class. But after I'm done setting up, I can answer your questions. I could just get in here. You said they can style it for this one. Or SEG and AN. It's reverse of what lab four was. So I think lab four went three to zero. I didn't do that through. Okay, well then it's the other way. Okay, I must have missed them up. But whatever it is for lab four, you got to do the reverse direction for lab five. Right. Instead, you know how, you know, I don't know why Dr. Mealy did it this way because by convention, the least significant bit is zero, right? In the he did it reverse. He made the most significant zero. Yeah, so that's the reason. What's that? <laughs> yeah. yeah.